Deep Jaswal. Um, I welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time out. I wanted to talk about uh, British India Postal Stationery. While well, I've been a collector of Indian states, pretty much all the states except for Travancore and Travancore Cochin, and British India Postal Stationery, um, I was asked by the organizing committee at Stockholmia to uh, give a master, hold a master class on exhibiting postal stationery. What the master class was designed and aimed for was to get exhibitors in postal stationery class who have won gold or below to help them uh, try to get to the large gold level. So here we are. Uh, I'm going to start by Sydney said i cannot move the the uh, screen what okay oh, sorry while well, my daughter tries to set it up for me i am i'm very bad when it comes to um i want to be able to use these oh all right so i just want to take a quick second to talk about the international show Pacific 1997, which took place in San Francisco. Um, I was a keen collector of both Indian states and British India Postal Stationery. At that time, a dealer from India approached me and, and um, mentioned he had some fabulous Indian states uh, items and if he could come over my house. And I invited him and unfortunately, make a long story short, my entire Indian States Postal Stationery two volume album was stolen from my house that day. I was so dejected that I basically decided not to collect postal stationery after that date. Um, although I had still, I still had my British India postal stationery collection with me. And then the very next year I met Wayne Manus, uh, who happens to be the uh, editor of UPSS United Postal Stationery Society. And Wayne convinced me not to give up on postal stationery. And uh, so here we are today. Uh, this exhibit of mine titled British India Queen Victoria Postal Stationery has, um, I've been exhibiting it since uh, 2013. Uh, the first FIP show I exhibited at was uh, in 2014 in Korea, which won a Vermeer, and then in, followed by 2015 in Singapore, the large Vermeer, and then you can see it as it goes down 2016. So it's, I've been very lucky that it, it's it advanced in, in metal level, um, step by step. Uh, what's critical to understanding what one needs and what one's missing is, is, is making a list, an inventory list of what one has. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I went about, made a list of what I was missing, and then I was very, very focused on, on trying to acquire the things I was missing. So one of the things I suggest, I strongly suggest people do is, is, to, um, is to make a list of what you're missing, what you need, and, and put it out there, put it out there for people to see. You just never know. Um, I, I put ads like, like this out in India Post Journal for the India Study Circle, and um, you know I, I was amazed at some of the things that were offered to me, things that I thought were unique. So that definitely helps. Um, another thing that helps with with knowledge and feedback and and, and is, is is writing articles in, in journals. Um, uh, you get to learn a lot more. Sorry. My mom keeps trying to call because it's my daughter's birthday today. Uh, anyways, um, so writing articles in, in, in philatelic journals is, is really important. And also it, it, it allows you to use that in your uh, uh, synopsis. And the judges understand and hopefully helps them in, in judging your exhibit. One of the things I do is I'm always on the lookout to improve, upgrade the quality of the items in my exhibit. Um, I, I keep it on a on a tablet and I travel with it. And you know, I anytime I'm offered something that I think maybe 
interesting. I'll, I'll look it up and compare it to copying my exhibit and say, oh, well, I do need this. So I think it's very important to um, look for, always be on the hunt for, to upgrade. Um, we just talked about carrying your exhibit on a tablet. Using the proper software, I, I think it's, it's, it's really important to know, to have a great understanding of the software you use. I used to use Word when I first started exhibiting, and then I met, well, I didn't meet, then uh, Pat Walker suggested that I uh, learn Publisher, and she was nice enough to take time out on, during a Westpac show and sit down with me on my laptop and teach me Publisher. It only took about an hour for her to teach me, and, and I have never looked back. Um, a big question is A3 versus A4 size pages to use. Um, I started off using regular A3 pages, but um, I, I'll tell you I'm a big fan of A4. And, I mean, sorry, I started off with A4, and I now exclusively use A3. But what I do is I actually go a little beyond A3. What I do is I, you know, most frames are designed to hold an A3, an A4, or an American size, which is 11 by 17 or eight and a half by 11. So uh, what I did was I have custom pages made, which uses the height of A3, but uses the width of American 11 by 17. So I get the best of both. So I end up getting a little, little bit extra real estate. And I've never had a problem with these custom sheets fitting in frames. Importance of synopsis. Uh, we may quite possibly be the expert on our given chosen field that we are exhibiting, but the judges don't know that, and the judges are not usually. I mean, they they'll read up, they'll read up on your exhibit before they judge it. But synopsis is really <clears throat> key to helping you, helping the judges understand your exhibit and your knowledge and your research. Uh, here's a copy of my synopsis. Um, and this is actually a page where, like, some, like Pat Walker told me once, synopsis is really, really your bragging page. So this is where you can put things that you would normally never put on the title page or any, anywhere else in the exhibit. There's a lot more lever allowed. Here's the second part of my synopsis. Next, we move on to title page. Be sure to define the purpose and scope very, very clearly so that there's no ambiguity as to what you're exhibiting and what the, what's the story you're trying to tell and what's the message you're conveying through the exhibit. Um, in my case, I wrote to display a detailed study of all Victorian postal stationery, dye varieties, paper varieties, printing errors, varieties, watermarks, embossed varieties, and shades are all within the scope of the exhibit. Special emphasis has been given to unusual and interesting usages. Forerunner postcards to demonstrate the development of the postcard fall within the scope of the exhibit. Victorian postal stationery overprint for the use of Indian convention states or other countries such as British East Africa and Zanzibar are outside the scope of this exhibit as they are no longer considered British in their postal stationery. It's very important when you define in your scope, it's just as equally important to define what is not included. So I say, for instance, uh, Victorian postal stationery overprinted a hand stamp for the use during the reign of King Edward VII as well as some official hand stamp and all prints are outside the scope of the exhibit. When you say that, it clears the judge's mind. Okay, so he knows, he or she knows right away that these things are not gonna be part of your exhibit. And so they don't expect to see it, find it in your exhibit. Um, title page, um, be sure to provide introduction and background uh, about your subject matter. Sometimes some of the information between previous section and this may overlap, but you can always be careful not to include the same information.
it's very important to show a chronological layout of your exhibit so that the viewer knows exactly what to find where in the in the exhibit and the sequence of things so they're not trying to figure out oh what's where uh, i try to use a very very simple numbering system so in, th in this case i start out with so a is one the number one stands for envelopes and then sub category one a is ordinary envelopes one b is official envelopes one c is cef envelopes and one d is siemens and soldiers and siemens envelopes so that's so one is a category and then a b c d are subcategories then we go to two three and four and and so forth section headers it's very important for the viewer to be able to see and recognize right away the start of a section of a new section so what i do is i i do it um, and this is how i do it so that it draws attention immediately without having to use really large font size which end up taking extra real estate on the page deciding on the very first item just like when you're telling a story if the starting is not has it doesn't have a big punch then you might lose the audience so i always suggest to start with a big bang now i know it's not always possible because the first item may not be the greatest item but we should try we should try to have an item that is just an incredible gem on the first page and then we do the same thing with the last item you want to end the story with a big bang also and you want to have an incredible item that leaves everybody wanting more when they see your last item the last item also needs to be a very important closure of your subject matter in this case i used the uh, only known example of a victorian postcard with black borders black morning borders to indicate the death of queen victoria page balance it's very important to have a nice visual balance on pages um so again publisher allows you to define and and just um and space things evenly distribute them horizontally distribute them vertically it you don't have to work at it it just click a button and it does it for, by itself balance another thing is um, we need to pay attention to the balance between pre-production issued items and use usages um, you don't want to overload one over the other so in this case i showed a cancelled item from the delaro archives an issued item two different bands because these envelopes were used issued in, in packets of 8 and 16 and then a, a nice interesting usage duplication and padding um, judges frown upon that there, there, there's a special term called padding which um, we've all been all exhibitors have been guilty of, guilty of um, resorting to every now and then because sometimes we run out of items and then we just add an extra item in this case I'll, I'll show this exhibitor has the last two items he's shown as he's, he's, he's written M shifted down and H shifted down these are trivial things that uh, that do not deserve space on, on, on this exhibit page so avoid trying to duplicate put duplicate items judges see that it's consistency between pages um your pages ought to look the same um the format should be the same the color scheme should be the same and the layout should be the same these are examples of three pages that appear next to each other in my exhibit use a numbering system that's easy to understand um, yeah, I've used just a simple A, B, C, D. And uh, use headers to indicate the start of a new section.
choice of paper font and ink color it's very important um, as a collector of Indian states and and British India postal stationery uh, I simply never use white paper I use uh, a shade of ecru eggshell off-white otherwise what happens is it, everything starts looking dirty against against a white background so that's just my personal philosophy I, I'll never use white paper for any exhibits that I do um, I don't like to use black as the <clears throat> text color because it's again it's a real contrast so I use chocolate brown that's my go-to color um, but that's that's me uh, matting uh, matting is really important to give a clean sharp borders for your items as we use older items they're not often in the perfect shape and condition and visually when you have a nice clean sharp lines around your item on display it makes it it makes it look nice and sharp and clean highlighting important items through matting so what i do is i mat all my stationary items in my exhibit and what i'll do is i'll use a contrast so so normal matting is a very light uh, color you can see it's just an, an, an cream color but then important items, uh, I mount them against a nice dark chocolate background. So when you step away from the exhibit, when you step back and look at the frame, you can see the highlight items without having to scan through the entire exhibit and, and look at it carefully and read. You can just step back and say, oh, these are the important items because they pop out against a dark background. Try using charts um, instead of text because space is limited. So drawings speak volumes try using drawings um, to explain rather than trying to explain the uh, you know that there's 17 lines per inch on the Turner Kent paper versus 20 lines per inch in the turkey mill paper it's so much easier to to draw it and and for the uh, viewer to be able to see what you're talking about again try using tables i love using tables it it makes it very easy and simple to follow even though it's a postal stationery exhibit one should have enough knowledge and it's almost expected by judges to be able to explain when you have an uprated item of postal stationery you ought to be able to explain what the uprate was for why was it uprated so for instance i very simple it doesn't have to be a big paragraph but just enough so that uh, the viewer can understand why there's additional franking on that piece of item so in this particular case, it says uh, six Anna stamps paying the six Anna steamer rate via Marseille plus half Anna after packet fee. As you can see it, okay. Placement of important items. Um, this is a challenge. When you're doing a multi-frame exhibit, you don't always have the option of being able to place the star items of your exhibit at the proper eye level because face it you know we're all old nobody's getting younger and it's gets really really difficult to bend down at the bottom of the frame to look at a really important item so i try i try very hard to rearrange pages to make sure that my star items end up at the best eye level possible doesn't always happen but it's always important to try We all have extraordinary and unusual and rare items in our exhibits. And to avoid any ambiguity and to avoid any controversy, whether the item is genuine or not, you may know that, but 
the judges don't know that. So I was at a I was a commissioner at the last show in Thailand, and one of the exhibits I was I had carried with me. Um, unfortunately, three of the items were pulled from the exhibit by judges, and they said no, they will not. These items need to be certified. So so be proactive. Important items that are going to be considered important to your exhibit that are going to draw attention. Make sure you get them expertized. BPA and the Royal are the two leading societies whose certificates are respected by virtually all. Make edges look, again, back to matting. If you look on the bottom left corner, you see that, that little corner is missing. But when you have a frame like this and a sharp, strong line around the item, it's not obvious, it's not visible, it almost disappears. And nobody's really gonna notice it. It's like you're hiding it, but it's there. It's not, it's not you're not covering it. Uh, very important that any repair and falls should be mentioned. You don't want the judges to find out um, on their own. So put it on the table. It's very important to draw attention to your own research work. Uh, so what I do is very simple. I've created the sixth column, which basically says, has this item been recorded previously? And uh, the ones that haven't, I put it in bold no. So those, that, so anybody looking at my exhibit understands that I have most likely discovered these items. And it's a nice bold, but it's not in your face. And you have a lot of information there without having to say a whole lot. Uh, refrain from using words such as scarce and rare to define the scarcity of items. Try to quantify. Rare and scarce, they're all very subjective terms. I, I've seen, I see listings on eBay where the seller says, extremely rare, uh, buy it now, $29. <laughs> How rare can it be? So refrain from using the word scarce and rare. What I do is I always try to quantify uh, in, in case of this particular item, I said believed to be one of three copies in private hands, one being in the Royal Collection. Um, avoid getting cornered. What I mean by that is, um, uh, I, see, I saw this happen once where there was an exhibit at an international show there were two exhibits on the same subject matter. And it happened to be Jammu Kashmir. And there was a cover with a particular franking where the exhibitor had written unique, only known example. And the very next exhibit had two of the exact same covers with the same franking. So you don't want to corner yourself by making claims that, I mean, anything's possible, you know, even the British Guiana, it's possible that another copy may show up someday. So yeah. I try to avoid that. I always write possibly unique. Um, uh, in this case, I wrote down discovery per copy, possibly unique. And then that conveys the message. You don't have to say it's unique. Uh, use postal notices, etc. strategically. When you're laying out your items and your pages, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll find that the, the items where you, the, the spaces on a page where you just can't balance things out, but there's not enough to put on a page. And unfortunately, you don't want to bring items from the next section into that page and you don't want to blend them. So that's when things like postal notices are great because they take up a lot of space, they fill up the page, and it doesn't and you don't try to pad your exhibit by putting duplicate items. Uh, you don't want to use a whole bunch of them, but every now and then I probably use maybe three postal notices in my exhibit in an eight frame exhibit. Three or four is fine. Uh, and also it, it, it conveys important message. It tells you, I mean, this is a great notice it says special registered envelopes were 
are provided by the post office with a Tuana and Bar stamp. So it's important to that particular item. If you're uncertain of a theory, then it's best not to state it. You don't want to say, state, make comments or come up with theories that you cannot prove or disprove. You don't want to leave open-ended questions because then it just shows lack of knowledge or lack of research. So if you've got an ambiguous question, it's better just to avoid it altogether. All right, so you're supposed to be the expert on your subject matter. Do not show lack of knowledge by leaving a question unanswered. Uh, what I mean is if you're going to raise a question, then you best answer it as well. So in this case, for example, I'm talking about die six um, letter sheets, uh, which have not been recorded to date. So I write basically the exhibit has come to the conclusion that die six was the first die employed in the production of letter sheets based on the fact that Delarue had a policy of overprinting specimen on the small quantity. Blah, blah, blah. So I go down, it says the exhibitor believes that the entire stock of die six was recalled. Die six letter sheets are also devoid of the manufacturer's imprint, which is found on all subsequently produced letter sheets. So that's a good logical step for me to explain and say, wait, die six was the, the first letter sheet issued because they did not have the chain lines. And um, so the embossing, Queen Victoria's head embossing was coming off of the letter sheet. And so to correct that, they ended up using late paper with chain lines in, in subsequent printings. Attend each and every judge's critique and be sure to record what the judges have to say. And what I do is I'll, I'll, I attend every possible judge's critique where I'm exhibiting. At times I'll, I'll attend judge's critique even when I have no exhibits at that particular show. And what I do is I turn my phone on uh, and I start videotaping everything because it's impossible to remember everything that was discussed and said about your exhibit at the time. So it's best if you tape it, you can go home, you can listen to it and then, um, and then you know, utilize that information that was given out. These judges know a thing or two about exhibiting so we can always learn from them. Ask the team leader to critique your exhibit at the frames. That is an amazing service that is offered by judges and please take advantage of it. I took advantage of this in New York. I had uh, Mr. Bernie Beston spend almost two hours at my frame going through each and every single page. And I must say that uh, my exhibit has improved. And a great deal of that goes to uh, Mr. Bernie Beston for taking the time out to help me understand the changes and the corrections I needed to make to my exhibit. Mr. Singhi did the exact same thing for me in Thailand, which I was most appreciative of. We may know everything we think we need to know about exhibit, but believe me when I tell you, uh, you can't go wrong by listening to what the judges and team leaders have to say about your own exhibit. Patience is a virtue. I wish I believed in that all the time because I, I, I want everything done right away, but building a world-class exhibit takes time. And you know, all I can say is Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> <laughs>